making this possible. Uh, I really appreciate uh, being here. Um, um, in case you, you probably don't know, but I used to work here many years ago. Uh, I actually did my internship here uh, when I finished uh, my museum studies uh, at George Washington University, which we were yesterday. Uh, and then, uh, then I had the privilege of working for uh, then the curator of Islamic arts, uh, Esin Atil, uh, as her uh, curatorial research assistant. And uh, so these, this gallery has a special place in my heart. And uh, I always wanted to come back here with the lens of empathy. And, and, and it is happening now, so I'm grateful to Grace uh, and uh, Hussein for, and Jennifer and everyone, uh, Demi and everyone, uh, uh, the team, uh, National Museum of Asian Art team, uh, for uh, making this possible. Uh, so this, uh, I mentioned earlier that unfortunately, uh, Mohammed Zakaria, Hoja uh, Zakaria uh, uh, is sick, so he couldn't be here. Uh, but uh, Aisha is his student, and I was a student, and, and with uh, Zakaria Hoja's de definition, you know, once you're a student, you're a student until you're, you're dead. <laughs> so I, I consider still a, uh, myself a student. Uh, but um, uh, so we're just going to explore some ideas uh, on the role of empathy. What does empathy look like? in the transmission of traditional sacred arts. And, and I invited this morning also Andrew, and we didn't plan for this, uh, but you know, Andrew kind of agreed, because his work is quite spiritual to me. I mean, like all of the props that we just received in his workshop, I'm like, yes, yes, you know, I, 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 it resonated so much with me in terms of spiritual growth, and uh, really it was a lesson in analogies <laughs> and metaphors, and, um, so I thought that it would be a really interesting opportunity to really go to uncharted waters and see what comes out. You know, because that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to figure out the alchemy of empathy. So it is not just pure science. It is not just pure art. It's a mixture of the two and more. So here we are trying to find what, what more there is to, uh, to know about the human experience. And, uh, and with that, you know, I would like to invite uh, Aisha to first introduce herself, uh, and uh, and then she kindly prepared some notes uh, based on her uh, discussions with uh, Muhammad Zakaria. Uh, and um, I don't have his bio with me, but uh, I should have brought it actually. But he's a master calligrapher. He has an amazingly interesting life story. Uh, I would really uh, uh, highly recommend that you look into his bio where he came from and achieved the, uh, the things that he achieved and he became an inspiration to many people around the world. Um, and uh, Aisha was kind enough to pull together uh, some notes for us, uh, specifically uh, focusing on our discussion, the alchemy of empathy. So, uh, and I'm still hoping that one day we'll get to interview Muhammad Zakaria, to keep, you know, record how he describes. Uh, so maybe we can use it later on you know, in another summit or uh, if anyone is interested in this, uh, we can go into it. Um, so, let's dive And uh, Is everybody okay? You can still take a seat here if you like. Uh, uh, okay, thank you so much again. Yes, Aisha. All right, thank you. Thank you, Alice, and thank you everyone at the Sackler, for your Sackler. Um, welcome, guys. I'm really happy to talk to you. I'm sorry, I was, as I was telling someone earlier, it's like, you were promised a lunch, and there's no meat, and I, you've got the potatoes, and it's me. <laughs> but uh, Muhammad Zakaria is a phenomenon. I'm sorry that he's not here, because he's just a, a, a joy to meet. And just, just meeting him and seeing what he looks like, how he speaks, so much is conveyed of his life journey. Um, I do have to share a little bit about my teacher. Um, so that you kind of understand the context of calligraphy in the United States. Muhammad Zakaria was born shortly after the World, World War uh, II, uh, and he came of age in the 60s. He um, is a white American from California, and uh, like many young adults, wanted to go and explore the world. And he went to a travel agent, tried to get a ticket to Haiti, it was too expensive, and the agent told him, go get on a freight ship, and maybe you could go see Morocco. 
So he went to Morocco, like many cultural travelers of that uh, decade, and it basically uh, changed the course of his life. Um, he was able to witness living Islam and how um, Islamic principles are practiced on a day-to-day -day basis. He was immersed in Islamic calligraphy or Arabic script calligraphy as he, as he refers to, which is some examples are in the back over there. And uh, he came back uh, to the United States. He really loved it. He became a Muslim, uh, much to the great dismay of his family. And uh, he landed in Washington, D.C. Here he met a beautiful woman named Sally, Sally Zakaria, who is now a poet. They both turned 80 this May. Um, they've had a long life together. Um, the Smithsonian Freer Sackler Gallery was a very important part of his life. Uh, when he ended up in D.C., he would come and visit the museum all the time. He struck up a friendship with Dr. Atzal. Yes, Dr. Atzal, mm -hmm. right? And she was a Turkish, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was a Turkish woman. She liked him. He liked her. He liked everybody at the gallery, though. He he ta he talks about it fondly. He said, "I was just a kid. I was scruffy, and I would come in, and they would talk to me, <laughs> <laughs> and they would tell me how things were made, and they would give me the time of day." So um, now, after he'd gone to Morocco, he had. Um, well, before he went to Morocco, he was hanging out in Venice Beach and he saw a piece of calligraphy, Arabic script calligraphy, in the store of an Armenian carpet seller. And he walked up there and he said, what is that? And the Armenian shopkeeper was like, it's too expensive for you, scat kid. And that was the perfect ingredient for Zachariah because it really angered him and he promised himself that he was going to figure out what that was. And so on his travels, including Morocco, so Morocco, as you can imagine, was an amazing uh, place for him to be, he ended up after Morocco, he went to, uh, the U to, to England. He was part of a theater troupe, and he played the comedian role in this troupe. And um, he would paint houses during the day, and then he would go to the British Museum and pour over Islamic manuscripts during um, after hours. And that's where he started working backwards. Um, from looking at these manuscripts and then trying to piece it together to figure out how to create these things. He came back to DC, he struck up the friendship with the, the curator here, and at this point he'd been working on his own pieces of calligraphy for 15 years. She said, listen, if you really love this, and clearly you do, you really need to go to Turkey and learn the, the right way, the traditional way. So it was because of her that she put him in touch with a teacher in Istanbul. Now, Turkey also, as you know, um, was in a spot with calligraphy. Calligraphy was a very beautiful art form in Turkey and a lot of Muslim countries. But in Turkey in 1927, 1928, the script was transitioned into Latin, the Latin alphabet. So as, as popular and revered as the calligraphers were at that point, 20s onwards, it really wasn't. It wasn't lucrative, it wasn't sexy, it just was not the place to be. So there weren't that many teachers. So he did find himself one teacher who didn't speak a word of English. And um, he went over to I Istanbul, he spent a month and a half there. They sort of made it work, and then he came back to Washington and they continued over the next eight, I think eight to 10 years uh, through, through the mail, through the postal system. And uh, to give you, it gives you a little idea of what Zachary, who Zachariah really is. Um, they were exchanging letters, he would write a line, the teacher would respond with, in red, the line in another way, and he was supposed to figure it out. Um, he got frustrated, he needed to know more details, so he started teaching himself Arabic. And the Turkish calligrapher in Istanbul was like, you know, I know Arabic, but I don't know it well enough to write in his technical directions. So then, a few years later, Zakaria decided to learn Turkish. <laughs> and so um, they, th there was a little bit more progress made that way, and then um, he did, he did uh, obtain his diploma, or ijazah, to teach and to become a master calligrapher about eight to 10 years afterwards. Um, I also run an organization, it's called Reed Society for the Sacred Arts. 
Um, reed society is basically symbolic of the pen um, that, that calligraphers use to write. The reed is an organic material. It's like a hollow straw. And it's also, it also, it's also used in music, the reed flute. So we do both the art and music. Um, but going back to what you said about oral tradition, a lot of the sacred arts are conveyed through oral transmission. And it's hard to be able to preserve that um, over time. And especially the Islamic arts, I feel like are, are even more harder to preserve because of the global upheaval, of war, of all that stuff. Things get lost. And that's why the Tibet Museum, Tenzin, um, it really struck a nerve with me because they were running from oppression. They had to create a museum. It was a museum created by Tibetans of things that they wanted to keep in their memory. So the thing is, is Zakaria is, is unique and singular in his study and his practice of calligraphy. He single-handedly brought the, um, the tradition of Ottoman calligraphy to the West. So he teaches people in the United States, in Europe, um, and sure, people play around with Arabic script, you know, graffiti and whatnot, but the, the art was conveyed by him. And, um, and so there's three ways that he mentioned when we were speaking and preparing for this talk about how empathy is con conveyed in traditional art forms such as calligraphy. And the first one is, um, is the lineage, right? Like each one of us are here because we have a chain of human beings above us, right? Like we have a mother and a father and a grandfather. So artists, um, especially in the traditional uh, method, have a chain. We have an artistic family tree, if you will. And his family tree um, is very well preserved. We know who his teacher was and his teacher was. And that goes back to the founder of Ottoman calligraphy, who is Sheikh Hamdullah. And there are three institutions in the United States that have a Sheikh Hamdullah manuscript, the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, the Met in New York, and the University of Michigan. So the silsila is a very, okay, the lineage is often referred to as a silsila, and that's very important on many, many levels. My background is South Asian. I was born and brought up in Chicago. My parents um, are originally Indian, but after the partition, a lot of my family moved to Pakistan. A lot of things fell off the table in our, in our uh, migration, if you will. Lots of things uh, fell, including our language. Uh, my children don't speak Urdu. I am very, you know, rusty in my Urdu. But um, the thing is, is the moment that I was struck um, about uh, my husband and his family is from Kashmir. Kashmir was untouched by the partition. Uh, when I visited my husband's um, family, I saw that they had a family cemetery. They had a home that, two, that people had lived in for 200 years. And that was the first time I realized I had pieces of me missing. <laughs> I thought I was intact and I was whole. I had like an arm missing, you know? I was like, oh, I don't have access to this. I have never gone to a graveyard that my grandparents had been buried in. I, it, it, was, it was astonishing to me. So I think, in the, I, I just want to say this because I really believe it, that museums can offer um, this portion of people back to them. If they do it, if they do it astutely, it, it can be done. And, um, and they have the resources. So um, the thing about the lineage is that there's a lot of cultural intelligence that's um, transmitted generation by generation. Zakaria looked at these pieces and he moved backwards. He saw this thing and let's say this manuscript or this, there is um, so much in it, like frozen in time in these bowls, right? This paint color, how do you mix it? How do you use this brush? What are these tiny little tricks and tips and inspirations, frankly, that are poured into these works of art? He took it and he worked backwards. He had no other resource. He didn't know where to start. He worked backwards. But then when he found the people that could teach him, he just, I mean, he became an ecosystem. Typically, when people work on calligraphy, they're just writing. 
They're not worried about creating the paper. They're not worried about the illumination. They're not worried about Ebru. Um, these were ecosystems that existed in different countries, in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Turkey. He had to do it himself. He himself is an ecosystem. But originally, the ecosystems showed that people were interconnected, right? You, you had to get on with your illuminator because you wouldn't have an illuminated manuscript <laughs> if you were annoyed by his, you know, barking dog. Uh, so, so that's an important part. But he became the ecosystem, and he started teaching all of us and lots of people um, all these different types of arts. So um, the, the, the lineage is very important in the, um, in the world of traditional and sacred art. Um, the second thing he said was, of course, the empathy is developed through the master-student relationship. He hates the word master, the teacher-student relationship. Um, that's maybe obvious, but the thing about your teacher, as you know, is love is created and you may be striving for a diploma or your ijazah over for 10 years but that relationship is um, like you said till you die <laughs> <laughs> and um, he has teachers uh, he has students that are now teachers in their own right but they come back they confer they they get advice from him um, it's a lifelong relationship the thing that he mentioned in your book, Designing for Empathy, was that you are supposed to kind of, the teacher sort of reflects the information on the student's heart. I, I know that sounds kooky, but it's kind of like, he's, he actually called it mind reading. And my only experience that I can share with you is when uh, three or four years into my, you know, working, working with him, I was sitting in his studio and like I said, you know, I, I have a South Asian background. Where I come from, we love color. <laughs> and I had no qualms growing up in the United States wearing, you know, ethnic stuff, lots of color. I mean, we have like mirrors on our little court leaves, you know. I, I love that, okay. But um, when we moved to DC in 2005, I was sitting in a studio and um, I, I, I don't know, all of a sudden something felt off. And I was like, what is, What's, what's wrong? It was like almost like, you know, when you sm smell something bad, you just know, you're like, whoa, whoa, what is that? And I'm looking around, and I realize his whole studio, it's like earth tones. Everything is earth tones. His, forget his work, that's definitely earth tones, but like his furniture, his de decor, and guess what I was wearing? I was wearing this like really loud orange dress. <laughs> and I realized it was me that was off. I, my, I think it's like a frequency thing or something, maybe. Like the, the waves coming off my dress were just like, like it was like he was more like, you know? And I knew I was off. And that was just like, it was kind of like a sixth sense where I was like, oh. And, and I think that's how teachers teach. I think that's, it's an intimate relationship. It's not your nuclear, you know, family of origin where you get to know all the like isms of your mom or your dad or your siblings. But you move on, right? That's the point. We're supposed to make a build bigger world as we go forward. You're supposed to move on and have a relationship with other people. And with the teacher, it's such an intimate relationship. You just, you can't get around it, you know? You have to figure out what bothers them and kind of like <laughs> realign a little. So I'm not going to say too much about the teacher-student relationship. I'm going to let you in a little bit because I think it's obvious. It shows you that it's an intimate relationship. You're spending a lot of time with people. You understand how to get on, I guess. But the third thing I, I want to end with is what he mentioned, which is um, the relationship between the work, well, the artist and the audience. And um, he calls that visual empathy. Um, he, he believes that the majority of that um, conversation is in the breath-like flow. And actually, your work really demonstrated that to me. Everything is little, little pieces, right? Like we are explaining things to ourselves as we're writing, okay, up, down, you know, like bit by bit. And we're teaching our mind so our body can over, take it over at some point. Um, but what is the effect that we're going for? 
It's breath like, you're supposed to think it's so easy. Like a 10 year old goes home and practices tap dancing because he can do it. It looks easy, but it's not, right? And so that is what he strives for to basically create awe and wonder in the viewer. And we are like, how hard can that be? Like, I'm going to pick up a pen. Okay, fine. It's a permanent marker. No problem. I'm going to do this. And, um, you know, that art critic just passed away, Peter. Peter Sheldell, and he was talking about how um, he was, he, he talked about how bumpy the relationship between an art critic and artists are. Art critics want to hang out with the artists for their mojo, and, and the artists want to hang out with the critics for their um, expertise. He said that one time at a party, um, there was an artist and she was like abandoning her canvas, and she offered him um, you know, a brush to kind of paint over her work. And he said that he took her brush and he tried to imitate the stroke um, that was on her painting. And it shocked him. That I loved how he described it, and that's why we remember him. It was like a flaccid sort of movement to her very pressured, deliberate, and strong uh, movement in that stroke. So, um, so these are the things that you, that go into a finished product, um, and 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 basically having the, a, a viewer uh, gaze upon a finished product, you have made a relationship with someone that might be living or has passed away, but you have made contact. So those are kind of a few thoughts I had that I wanted to share with all of you. This, that was just wonderful. It was just, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, I have like ideas and thoughts going through my mind. Um, I, I wanted to also, uh, I don't know if you, what you can share about this, but you, you mentioned that he uh, makes his own paper yes. and, and he figured out how to make the, that kind of paper. Right. And that kind of paper is very special because no bugs can get to them. You know, they use you know, certain ingredients that, you know, these manuscripts last for 500, 600, 800 years. Mm. And, and so there's this knowledge that we just take it as a whole paper, but you know you have to have uh, eggs that are only you know like uh, 40 minutes old, <laughs> and then you take the egg and you know do something to them, use only this part, and then there are certain parts of the animal that you know you really know how to get and when to get and quickly incorporate, right? And one of the things that he uh, used to talk about, for example, back in the day when he was in, in the UK and he uh, used to go to the British Museum, uh, those times were different for museums. They would allow people to actually hold, you know, manuscripts with their bare hands and they would just like, you know, <laughs> put their <laughs> Take a left from the, the exit. Exactly. Yeah. 
Hmm. And, and so, um, and so he's that type of like curiosity and you know, my, 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 uh, life energy. Mm -hmm. And I think you call that love, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, love is not something that's, you know, like, okay, uh, I love this. That's not the end goal. Right. Love is the reason right. why, you know, he did all that and just did it for the sake of it, right. you know? And, and, and it, it transmits to us through what um, he has created and we love it. And then tomorrow, I know Zoran and Pablo, I keep like looking at, oh, there's so much into our conversation. Their, their whole motto is, you know, uh, using art as a mirror. Mm. So it will be an interesting conversation to move forward. But I'm also, I would love to hear, you know, like, how does this conversation resonate uh, with you from your perspective? Especially with your, your teacher. I think that's very teacher. interesting. Yeah. Because you said, you mentioned your teacher and we all do. <laughs> We were like, oh, and it was social, what, social branding, social proof, where you mentioned that? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, tell me more. <laughs> I, <didn't know. laughs> um, I guess so, a little bit of my story. My parents are both from Beirut, Lebanon. Mm. I was born in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So they left Lebanon in 76 on account of the Civil War. They landed in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I was born there. I grew up in Alexandria, Virginia. I started tap dancing at a local dance studio. Uh, Chris Collins Dance Studio. Mr. Chris and I had lunch on Tuesday, so he's still around. Um, and then when I was 11, I met Gregory Hines and Savion Glover. Gregory and Savion took a liking to me and introduced me to their teachers over the next 10 years. So as a teenager, my best friends were 60, 70, and 80 year old <laughs> African American men and women um, who were steeped in the improvisational tradition of tap dancing. Um, I was one of very few people in my generation to have experience with a multitude of teachers. And so, uh, unlike kind of a, a teacher student where you have one teacher and your goal is to emulate that teacher and that's, that's the thing, I kind of was passed around. And so they all loved me and they all thought like, well this is really interesting, this young kid that just seems to show up everywhere and likes us. <laughs> Um, maybe I'll give him a note. And, and the way it was is they would give you a note and then the next time they saw you, which was maybe six or eight months later, they would look at you and they say, well, and you might say, what? And they say, well, that thing that I showed you. And, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is how this works? Okay. <laughs> so the expectation was that even away from them, you're working. Um, in the tap dance world, uh, there's two, there's two views of the craft. One is sacred and very connected to the identity of the community of origin of the craft. And the other one is commercial. For obvious reasons, I would suspect, right? Very early on in the origin of this craft in this country, the move went from something that people did to something that people did to get paid. Right? And that transference happens often between communities of origin that have expressions that are outside of commerce to using that expression for the sake of commerce or for the sake of exchange in commerce. Um, and that brings up a multitude of complexities. Right? Because I don't know how much of what it is that I do would have happened unless commerce existed. Right? Or unless the... the the organization of training and competition and innovation that comes from competition around commerce existed. Because the rules of an oral tradition that is not in commerce are different. It's not competitive, it's collaborative. Because it goes towards the remembering, literal remembering of the community's identity through the expression. So the only way that I, as the son of Lebanese folks who happened to land in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, could be considered a representative of a craft like tap dancing is on account of being grafted in. Right? And so I feel like in some way my journey is like a model of hope because it is possible to be grafted in but it takes the generosity of the people who want to graft you in and the love of the person who wants to be grafted in 
to make that bridge happen. And it takes a significant amount of gestation. Right? Anybody here have ever grafted a plant? Sweet, right? <laughs> so the stuff that happens to the plant inside the wrapping <laughs> happens in life. Right? And I think that the pace of that is something that we don't experience often. Um, or don't, maybe don't have a mind to experience. Um, so my teachers, you know, if you were to see me perform and like just Im dance improvisationally, you would see glimpses of a few different people. And hopefully, you would see a glimpse of me. Right, because I can't escape myself. <laughs> And I think that in tap dance, one of the ethics of the craft is not innovation for innovation's sake, right? But innovation for contribution to the, to the good of the community. Um, it runs way faster than like the, what the calligraphy tradition would be in terms of the mimicry and the, I do this because this is what it is. It runs a little bit faster than that in that people, my teachers encourage me to find a voice in the tradition of the craft. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, I can see, I can see Greg, I can see Savion, I can see Henry, I can see Mabel, and I can see Andrew. And so that turn is a, is a specific thing um, that I think, you see it in jazz music as well, if you want to hear the voice of the trumpet player, you will hear the voices of his teacher or her teacher in them. But you also want to hear that voice. You guys know who Les Paul is? Yeah. The guitars? He told me once, um, he played on the radio. And he went back home to his mom and said, well, what'd you think? Like, first radio game. Big deal, right? And his mom sat back and said, I couldn't tell if it was you or anybody else playing the guitar. They all sound the same. <laughs> and that was the moment that he decided to try and sound different from everybody else. Right? So, so interesting. Um, so I guess this is a long answer. Um, but there, there is a tension that I've experienced in tap dance land that might be metaphor or analogy to the idea of a pluralistic society in that there is a tradition that is good and healthy to whatever extent it is good and healthy for the current context. And there's an honoring of every individual voice to the extent that it contributes to the tradition. Right? And who decides what a contribution is is up for grabs. But that spin and that balance between this is the way we did, this is what you're doing now, and what, what could that make for what's next seems to be really interesting. And you refer to tap dancing as an oral tradition, mm -hmm. right? None so, of it's written down. So that's also very interesting for those of us who are not familiar with that, you know? Like yeah, it's embodied. It's embodied. It's embodied. Right, which I would look at calligraphy as the same, right? The craft work is in the artist putting the pen to paper. The manuscript is the artifact. Exactly. Right? Tap dancing doesn't have an artifact. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think, you know, all great calligraphers were uh, either very good archers, that's how they trained yeah. uh, the, the muscles, because it takes a lot of precision mm -hmm. to have the right stroke and the right pressure. Super so either archers or good swimmers, uh, and, and uh, they always, almost all of them had another profession also, yeah. you know, another uh, talent. And uh, talking about the crafting, is it grafting, crafting? Grafting. Grafting, okay. Yeah. I know what, what it is, but I yeah. don't know. And, um, so, for example, in, uh, in Zakaria Hoja's studio, it would look like he would open the door, oh, welcome, you know, you would take off your shoes, and you would go into this, you know, uh, little office. It is full of paper and, you know, hundreds of different kinds of reed pens and different sizes and shapes, and the, the sort of like, really like the alchemist studio, you know, like little bottles of, you know, materials, you know, pulverize something here and there. And then he would say, you know, oh, oh, I'll make some tea. You know, like that would be the, I think it's the universal in Turkish culture, but I mean, <laughs> and also, uh, yeah. I don't know, probably. Uh, but, uh, so uh, definitely tea is involved, you know, something sweet, whatever is available. And then you would just talk. 
you know, it wasn't like, okay, now, okay, open up your, you know, so what have you done, let me see, it's not like that at all. It is very organic, it is love-based and dialogue-based, it's respect-based, and uh, it's an understa shared understanding of the commitment and respect of the time of the, each person, and it's his or her own being. And then, um, and then, um, uh, really, maybe, I mean, if he has the time, he might look at your work for like five minutes uh, after you know, an hour and a half of conversation and looking at all kinds of books and then he pulls up this book from you know uh, like a 14th century that he has to have, you know, he had a copy of, of some uh, really uh, forgotten language of this, uh, forgotten translation of this very important book uh, in Ottoman Turkish which is uh, the, the script is no longer exists, but and the language is very mixed of like Arabic and uh, Persian. So mm. really, like I wouldn't understand if somebody spoke in that language if it's, it's called Turkish. So he would just pick that up and it's like, oh, you know, like, I remember like this guy talked about this and he pulls up that book from like mm. <laughs> 1459 and then like, starts reading it. It's like, oh, I was doing this wrong, you know, and then he just like, oh, the eggs shouldn't be like 40 minutes. It's like 38 minutes exactly. So that's how he. It's like this living energy and you know curiosity, and and, and that's how you see the art happening. Uh -huh. So it is not just you see him write or he just corrects your writing. There's so much more than that. It sounds like immersion into the context. Yes, exactly. Right, which is formative. Which I don't I don't know. I don't know how many experiences we have that are like that very on an ongoing very, basis, very right? Very. What is it then? Is it like lack of time, attention? Somebody mentioned yesterday, attention. Attention is so, so uh, precious that, you know, I mean, time is precious, but our attention is even more precious, what we pay attention to, right? Uh, and, um, well, why do you think that that's happening? That we don't have those opportunities? Like, I mean, I have not met anybody like Zakaria, and I don't think I will ever, I, I ever will. But uh, and, and some individuals are unique, you know. I mean, they are geniuses and very you know, amazing people in their own right. Uh, but can we foster those environments where this kind of open dialogue happens without any expectations? But there's this understanding of shared commitment towards the shared vision. But there is no, not a, like a forceful right. sort of dominance or power dynamics. Yeah, it's not imposed in the it's best of scenarios. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder what, what are those qualities because we're talking about the alchemy of empathy, right? What is it that relationship that really invites us in to someone else's world without feeling judged or, you know, Uh, sort of 
made with this intention, made with this all this sort of like richness, mm -hmm. perhaps has the power to also uh, communicate that, which is very unique and we don't get it very often. Just like being in the presence of a great you know, artist, also art, right? Uh, what makes us art? What makes our hearts sink? Um, and I'm going to go on a totally unrelated uh, example, but um, years ago, I, um, when I first was interested in writing about empathy, uh, I read this uh, Nobel, I read about this, uh, I think, Japanese Nobel Prize winner on, um, I forget what area, but he was uh, working on uh, stem cells, you know, genetics, and, and uh, he uh, found a way to uh, sort of backtrack a regular skin cell to be any cell in our body. Mm. So if you are missing, you know, if your heart needed repair, your skin cell, the, the, the mixture of proteins that he found, uh, would allow that skin cell to beat like a heart. It becomes a heart cell, mm -hmm. and, and he he explained this. He was just explaining to the you know like these global uh, videos that you know this is what I did. I'm like, oh. <laughs> 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 I mean, I took it at a, a different level, but he was saying, like, yeah, you know, I bought the, you know all of these like uh, different combinations of proteins that I tried. A lot of them worked, and one day I said like I'm gonna mix them all. You know, that's what he did. Yeah. You know, there were like 14 different proteins, and then he mixed it, and then he tried. And then next time you know, he uh, viewed the cell, the skin cell, uh, it was pulsating, it was beating like a heart, it became a heart cell. Mm -hmm. And he said, my heart synchronized with it. He had a, like a moment of <coughs> and, um, sort of, he, his heart skipped a beat and then started synchronizing with this um, potential of my heart, right? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm getting back. <laughs> but uh, so things like that. <laughs> I think you can tie it back to what you had said earlier, where the audience and the performers are synchronized. Is that right? Is mm -hmm. that what you said? The audience, the, so we know that audiences synchronize their heartbeat if they're seeing the same performance. And then the, the question was, what happens if the performers are doing the same thing and are able to synchronize their breath? Oh wow! Right, so that their their hearts are synchronized. Uh -huh. I don't know if it would be the same, uh -huh. but at least you, you now have like we know that human beings do that right. in shared context. Right, and we also know from from at least from the dance perspective that human beings can articulate that like. I can get a group of people to breathe together mm -hmm. as they're expressing something. Mm -hmm. And does, okay. does that speed up synchronicity in terms of like the physio physiology of everything? I don't know. That. Like those are posed questions. But I start wondering about if we get ahead of the formation curve, like who we are becoming, mm -hmm. and get engaged in that process, at least to the degree that our limited nature can what happens. It's very interesting, especially in the teaching context. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was really interesting. High levels of responsibility. Yes, sir. Can I ask a question from my Sure, sure. Um, I'm kind of curious to hear, first of all, like when you review a lot about like, following what someone is saying or so, someone is doing, and I'm kind of building off of what um, Andrew was saying about how do you find your voice while you're saying while you're trying to be there. Like, where does that orange dress show up in that writing that is you, but it's following Well, I think, I mean, there, that, I, I wanted to address that a little. We do put, pour ourselves in, but after the training is complete. Um, I have a, three series of beautiful calligraphy pieces by a Spanish woman that he trained. And someone walked into my house and said, you know, I know those are yours, but they are Nuria. But her name is Nuria. It was like her presence was there. It was palpable. Mm -hmm. So I do think that a little bit more like what Andrew was saying is, you know, there is those flickers of you. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a unique, you know, concoction, if you will. Um, it's, 
it's it's human life. I mean, you can't like eliminate the person doing it, you know, into the into the final product. But I, and and he offers a long leash in that regard. He does allow people to you know experiment and things, but it has to be within a certain way because what is he doing? He's trying to like basically hone and refine your eyes, if you will. Like he, he's got to get us to a certain place, and then we can do what as we like. And lots of people have done all sorts of things after they've been trained. Yeah. It's really um, so I've got 8,000 excitement inside of me right now because, and I'm a teacher, and, you know, I think like you were saying when we were dancing, uh, you, you know, I'm like, amen <laughs> to, to everything, but one of the resounding things, the first thing is, every single class that I teach for 16 years, every class, every cohort, every day, we begin by breathing, and we all breathe together, and uh, my students, first start working on me, they think it's corny, mm -hmm. but we synchronize our breathing in class and then we get down to business. And there is definitely this synergy in what I find is that it builds trust. And for me, trust is what makes a good teacher and a student and a person in the world. And it enables you to work with a great master, it enables a master to be able to work with you and, and so on and so forth. But I was just really turned on by the, the breathing thing and what a difference that makes also the meaning of trust. And somehow, when you have that syncopation, if that's what it is, that synchrony, in the classroom that you're teaching, you can, and you've got to roll, you've got stuff you've got to get, but you can improv. And you don't know where you're going to go. And you can make a connection with the student. You don't even know what's going to happen. And it's amazing. And then you all can kind of fall in love with the idea and amazing start to occur that you didn't plan for, and then you go back and you frack lesson somehow where you need to be, you know. But it, a lot of it has to do with breathing, I would just as it as a teacher. And I, I stand by it, breathe together for just a few weeks, and then teach every lesson. I like that. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. It's Especially for workshops, right? We create, we, we offer workshops, and wouldn't that be interesting to make sure that every group, small cohorts, mm -hmm. are synchronized? Yeah. Even if the power pose, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. We agree. Really? We agree. And the power pose. Nice yeah. and strong. And then we agree. Beautiful. I think in the, uh, you know, uh, in, in some spiritual traditions, you know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the way how just remember as remembrance and you know you chant a certain you know uh, letter sound or word and uh, and read and uh, for example in uh, whirling dervishes for example right I mean they are in coherence with each other but they are each turning in their own pace and in their own universe really each becomes a universe of its own and uh, and how it is described in that tradition is that uh, each person becomes an axis mm -hmm. of to the source, you know, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and going back to Aisha's very first uh, imagery of the reed, uh, that's a major metaphor in Islamic art and Sufism uh, because reed is considered that you know it was once whole in this like bed of uh, reeds in a lake, and then it was just you know cut down, and then it just found itself in this foreign place, and then. Uh, for it to express this longing to become whole again, uh, it has to become empty inside so that the breath can flow and make that sound. And that sound of the reed flute, that's why that's the sound of longing. And, and, and individuals, you know, like those dervishes in a way. Uh, and and I, I feel like, and it's, I may be projecting my cultural bias, but even I see that in tap dancing when you dance, that it is, you know, I mean, something is flowing, you know, that's uh, just beyond you know, the, the physicality of things, you know, the sound and the person moving, but there's something else going on. And, uh, and, and that's, I guess, the beauty of being a human being, that we get to notice these things and we have the privilege to, you know, talk about them and explore. And it's such a uh, beauty and a privilege, right? Uh, so, uh, any other questions before we wrap up? 
and we can go on lunch, we can just have like tea and we can just uh, <laughs> some dates and talk uh, for another hour or two hours, but uh, uh, I really enjoyed this, I hope mm. you did too. I did. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>